there's this negative talk um, about people in the state of Florida as if all of us voted for him, as if all of us support this, right? So that's that's one, because I know and remember and understand what it was like when other countries looked at the United States, when you know who was president. And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, guys, gals, and non-binary pals to another episode of All the Above, the show that gives you an unstandardized take on education. I'm Jeffrey Garrett, one of your co-hosts, and I've been a middle and high school principal and a high school social studies teacher. And as always, I'm joined by... What up, family? It's Manuel Rustin, your favorite teacher's favorite teacher. I'm a high school history teacher here in the Los Angeles area. I've been at it for 19 years, and we've been at this all of the above stuff for 100 episodes, Jeff. This is episode <laughs> 100 right here. So, like, first and foremost, I just got to, like, congratulate you and like everybody that's been part of this show, all the folks who were there at the beginning, all the AOTA family, the listeners, the viewers who were there since the beginning, because this is a real milestone, Jeff. And to celebrate, I would like you to go ahead and count down your 100 favorite moments on all of the above. <laughs> go ahead. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. That, that sounds like the worst episode ever. <laughs> I, uh, I, I will say, Manuel, um, slight asterisk on the 100th yeah, uh, episode. It is the 100th full episode of All the Above, yeah. but we also have something like, I don't know, 92 or 93 uh, <laughs> uh, passing period episodes, which are, you know, for all intents and purposes, episodes of the show they're just podcast only so you know yeah. so really we have almost 200 episodes um that said it is a huge milestone uh for so many reasons because what like six years ago now uh we set out to make this show and had literally no idea what we were doing <laughs> And if you look back on some of the early, you know, iterations of things, uh, it was just funny. You know, we were like very <laughs> stiff reading teleprompters and, you know, just feeling out like, who are we going to be as hosts of the show and what the format was going to be and, you know, what we're comfortable with and not comfortable with and what worked and what didn't. And, uh, you know, it's been it's been quite a journey. Um and, I, and honestly, Manuel, I, I was looking this morning uh, when I was deciding on wardrobe for today's episode. I wanted to do it big. And I was like, what haven't I, what haven't I worn in a while? Um, and I was just looking back, honestly, just to see what I had worn in, <laughs> in recent episodes. And then I was also like, man, I, every time I look back at our YouTube channel and I see all these incredible people that we have had a chance yeah. to, you know, to speak with here on the show, it is kind of mind boggling that just the number of amazing educators, you know, scholars, practitioners, folks from sort of every corner uh, of the field of education, all of whom are doing, you know, just really interesting work and, uh, you know, giving their time to come here and speak with us and, and you know, share their thoughts with our audience about uh, just the fascinating, interesting issues in education that uh, sometimes we might not even know that, you know, that we cared about until we have someone on to talk about, you know, uh, the 50th anniversary of Title IX or, you know, what's happening in our most recent episode with, you know, inequities and in extracurricular activities or, you know, anti-racist education like like uh, a person who we're going to have on uh, today, uh, Manuel, for, for the second time. Uh, to talk to us about some of the insanity happening, you know, in, in right wing states across this country. So, you know, there's just so many amazing things we've had a chance to talk about on this show, amazing people we've had a chance to, you know, to connect with. So if you are new to the show, you got to you got to listen to this episode. You got to subscribe and you got to go back and start digging through the crates because, you know, we have 100 now uh, full episodes with video. Uh, for you to look through. And we have about 100 podcast episodes where you can uh, at least dig in with me and Manuel on these, you know, really compelling, interesting issues in, in the field of education. Yeah, absolutely, Jeff. So many of those conversations, those super dope guests that we've had in our full episodes, in our video episodes, like so many of those conversations are just as relevant today as when they were first recorded. And 
you know, it's a lot of folks, their, their memories might be fuzzy because of the pandemic and what that did to our concept of time. But like there was a time when very few folks in education were like seriously discussing issues around race or issues, you know, critical issues in our system. And, you know, on our show, we had so many episodes about anti-racism before anti-racism became like a buzzword because we had so many dope guests that have been doing this work since way before, way before the uh, protests, the massive protests of 2020. So yeah, so much there. So if you're new and even if you're not new, um, it it's worthwhile to take some time either from our website, aotashow.com or our YouTube channel or wherever just to like scroll back to some of those early episodes. Now, if you go way, way back to the beginning, yeah, those video episodes they're kind of hilarious, kind of hilarious. We were we were definitely trying to um, figure out how to how to get all that right and the 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 graphics and and the teleprompter reading and all that. You know, a little interesting, a little interesting, but conversations were still dope. Conversations were still dope for sure. So, uh, you know, definitely take some time out if you are new to the show. But even if you're not, like I said, I had to go back to an episode um, a little a little while ago because someone's name came up in conversation with somebody else. And I was like, oh, wait, that, that person was on our show and they do dope work. And I didn't, I couldn't really recall the details of that particular conversation. So I was like, let me listen to that again. And I went back and yeah, got my learn on yet again, because, you know, a lot of times when we're in the middle of making the show, I'm listening and I'm, and I'm doing my thing. But, you know, sometimes like in the editing process and then moving on to the next episode, I, I, I don't take the time to really reflect deeply sometimes on the content of what's discussed by some, some of our super dope guests. So I found that even myself, a co-host over here, needs to go back and, and re-listen to some of the conversations. So yeah, man, um, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. And 100 episodes video format. And we know most of our listeners are more of the listening variety, not the look at their beautiful faces on video variety. But even if you do <laughs> listen to the podcast, um, we drop the video links under underneath the episode. So definitely, you know, go over to that YouTube and at least give a quick thumbs up because that helps a lot. Even though we're not really big and active on the YouTube streets, you know, those thumbs up go a long way to like help the video pop up in other educators, YouTube algorithm feeds, whatever. So all that. But anyways, Jeff, episode 100. We have a super dope guest today. We're going to get our learn on. So go ahead and let us know what's on the agenda for this episode. Well, man, well, as usual, as we have done 100 times in a row now, I will say <laughs> confidently, uh, we got a good one for everybody today, Manuel. And I alluded to this earlier, but we are bringing back onto the show uh, for the second time, almost one year uh, to the date since we last had her on the show. Um, and that is Lorena Herman, who is an educator, author, uh, activist, I guess you might say, uh, someone out here in these education streets doing really important, compelling work, uh, writing about, teaching about, uh, supporting educators around issues of anti-racist education and, you know, closing equity gaps in schools for marginalized learners. Uh, Lorena is coming to us today, Manuel, with a particular lens of getting into the conversation about what is happening behind enemy lines over there in Florida. And, you know, especially I will say for many of us educators in, you know, places like California or maybe, you know, New York or the so-called blue states of the, of the union, we might not be experiencing the same kind of you know, intensity and, and actual threats to ourselves and our and our livelihood uh, with these draconian right wing, you know, censorship and white supremacist laws being put on the books, uh, you know, in states throughout the country, in particular in the South and, and the Midwest. Um, but Lorena is there. And uh, she, as the author of the book Textured Teaching, who joined us a year ago to talk about, you know, that book and kind of, you know, what great anti-racist pedagogy looks like is back with us to dig into, you know, kind of what is happening now uh, for educators like her in the state of Florida, what are, you know, our educators doing in response to these laws and going to just kind of dig into that topic with us today. I think it's going to be fascinating, Manuel. Uh, you definitely don't want to miss it. Yeah. Lorena Herman, Educolor in the building yet again. I uh, can't wait. This is going to be a super dope episode, Jeff. But of course, we have our, our do now. We're going to talk about some some headlines, some news in the world of education before we get to our guest. All right. So that's in our do now. And that's coming up next. Stay tuned. All right, Jeff, you know what time it is. It's time for our do now. And, you know, any any uh, skilled practitioner in education 
knows that you have to have some kind of entry points for our students before you get to the main concept, the main chunk of the lesson. And our do now, in this case, um, lets us explore some news in, in the world of education before we deep dive into the seminar, which will feature our super dope guest, Lorena Herman. And that explanation there is for folks who might be new to our show or to our full episodes. So, Jeff, this do now today, um, how are we going to do it? Well, Manuel, uh, today we are going to dig into some key terms, some key vocabulary with a lexicon, Manuel. All right. All right. Get that vocab up. Very important, very fundamental. And our first vocab term, Jeff, our first vocab term for today's do now is phony. Phony. Uh, you know, honestly, the when I hear that term, Manuel, the first thing I think about is ninth grade in, I think it, her name was Miss Sullivan's English class, and we read Catcher in the Rye. Ah. And I remember uh, Holden Caulfield was just calling everybody phonies, and I thought it was like so odd and like old fashioned sounding, but also I was like, I kind of respected how, he, how he, he, was, he was just calling everybody out, like, man, these phonies. And, uh, and so Holden Caulfield, I picture it as like, Probably something very different than, <laughs> than it actually was. Uh, but uh, that's what comes to mind for me uh, when I hear the word phony, Manuel. Nice, nice. I, I, I do wonder um, what Holden Caulfield will think about this world around us and about this particular story here because it's out here in these internets, a lot, of, a lot of phonies out here, a lot of phonies. And in this case, this story deals with a video of a principal that turned out to be a phony, not the principal, but the video was phony. All right, and we got this story by way of Vice News, thanks to some reporting by David Gilbert. And he reports that three high school students in the state of New York posted videos online that appeared to show a nearby middle school principal and a local sheriff making violent, racist remarks about black students. But these videos were deep fakes, which are videos that are significantly altered and forged using artificial intelligence to look like, in this case, the actual principal and the sheriff. In one video, in one of the videos, the deepfake shows the principal of nearby George Fisher Middle School, John Piscatella, shouting a string of racial slurs and saying that black students should be sent back to Africa. And this racist rant ended with a threat of violence, with the principal saying that he'd bring his gun to school. The videos, which were originally posted by three students from Carmel High School in February, were taken down and the school authorities condemned the, quote, blatant racism. But many parents at the school never saw the full videos before they were deleted, and most were completely unaware of the specific and racist threats made against black students. Some parents have publicly condemned the school authorities' lack of action, claiming that these videos are part of a wider problem of racist behavior in the district's schools, and also claiming that law enforcement has failed to take the threats made in the videos seriously enough. So, Jeff, this video featured the principal saying some just violently racist stuff about black students. And the video looked pretty real to me, but it wasn't. Jeff, what, is, what are your thoughts about this story? Yeah, I have many layers of thoughts about this story, actually, Manuel. The first one is like, yet again, we see evidence that like literally there's nothing good on social media for young people, man. Like, <laughs> I know that that's not actually true, but... I, as an administrator, as an educator, I cannot say this strongly enough to all the parents in the world. Like, keep your kids off social media as much as you can, however you can. I understand you're not going to live in a box and, you know, that it's sort of abstinence approaches are not necessarily the best way to get kids to behave responsibly and, and safely in the world. And also... Ain't nothing good happening on these social media streets with young people, man. Like, I really, ugh, I just, okay, that I'll get off my soapbox, but kids don't need to be on social media is lesson one, uh, or layer one. Layer two here, Manuel, is, you know, I find it interesting in the article, they're like, you know, this could point to the fact that they, like, the district and the region, you know, the community has issues with racism, and I'm like, could like it absolutely uh, is is confirmation that this community is having a real serious problem with issues of racism, racial intolerance, racial violence, threats of racial violence, uh, 
all of that, all of the above, uh, and something needs to be done. And so this is a school issue for sure. Um, absolutely, the school community needs to come together to think about how are we going to respond to this, what are our beliefs and values, and how do we educate students to not do harm in this way. Yet another reason that things like critical race theory are good for, for kids and the world. Uh, but this is clearly a community issue that, you know, that needs to be addressed. And then, okay, man, well, I will say layer three for me is the points in the article about the community being upset that the school and the district like didn't, you know, notify parents and, and this sort of thing. Putting on my administrator hat, I will say, Manuel, this is a very murky, gray kind of area um, in our profession because there, there are real questions to be grappled with here. Obviously, people who saw the video, and I don't know to what extent the video, you know, had now I assume it has been seen by, you know, many, many more people. But in the moment, I don't know to what extent they understood the video to be sort of contained in terms of who had exposure to it. And if you have something that, you know, sort of out of context seems like, oh my God, we like call the SWAT team, we have to shut down all the schools and, you know, there should be police everywhere on campus, right? You can do investigations at a school site and determine that a threat is actually not a credible threat, right? Um, and so giving this district or these, this school or these officials the benefit of the doubt for the moment, um, they may have done that and determined that like this isn't actually a credible threat. And then there comes the question of like, is it helpful to just notify everyone about every wild, crazy thing that gets said uh, relative to the school? Now, this is particularly egregious given the the hate speech, the racism, the impersonation of public officials, the public nature of it on social media. So, I, you know, I'm not going to say that they shouldn't have done a notification. I'm just going to say that, like, the, having been in these kinds of situations before, there's real questions about, like, is this an issue that, like, we found something that's kind of egregious with a particular kid or a particular set of kids, and, and these are kids, and it needs to be addressed in the same way that we address all kinds of other things when kids make mistakes. Like you call the parents in, there's some kind of, you know, disciplinary code that you have to follow from this, you know, the school in the district. There might be a restorative process that you engage in. There's some teaching that needs to be done with the kids about what the impact of their actions was. There's maybe an opportunity for them to make some sort of restitution. Like these are kids. We don't need to turn school into a police state even sometimes when kids' actions are egregious. Now, this is, you know, uh, threatening violence and racist violence and impersonating public officials is like way on the end of craziness here. So, so like, yeah. I want to stipulate that. I'm just saying I don't want the, you know, the sort of reaction to be like every time there's some sort of threat, we got to lock down school and have the SWAT team there. Like, right. that's not necessarily healthy uh, either, in, especially when we're talking about police who their presence most certainly does not make the black students who might be the target of this racist violence any more safe uh, in our schools. So th yeah. that's kind of my concoction of thoughts, Manuel. What are you thinking? Man, students made a video of a principal saying wildly racist and violent stuff. And the video looks very real. Like this whole story is wild to me, wild to me. Like I was trying to find the video because reading about it is one thing and they had screenshots in this particular article, which we'll link under this episode, but I couldn't find the video because of course it's been taken down and all that. But I did find a news report about the video and that news report played parts of the video. And when they played the video, I was like, oh wait, yeah, that's obviously fake. And they're like, that's the real part of the video. Then they played the fake part. So I was like, what the hell? Like, I, I, it's, it's wild what this technology can do. I can absolutely, absolutely see folks seeing this video and thinking it's real because, I mean, uh, it, it looked real to me and it sounded real to me. It was his actual voice, but the voice had been uh, modified with artificial intelligence to say words that he didn't actually say. And just that whole landscape is is truly terrifying because, um, I mean, just think about the repercussions generally outside of education. Just think about how many, you know, folks will be thumbing through social media and see some video of the, some politician, some celebrity saying something that they didn't actually say. So the repercussions are are really wild. But um, in the in case in the case of this story, um, just as educators, like this is um, just another another added stressor, another 
added layer of the difficulty of being an educator now because um, certainly this won't be the last video and there's probably other videos out there and stories that we didn't uh, come across ourselves. So just thinking about the potential for teachers and for principals in this case and other folks to be uh, construed in a certain way on social media and that to spread around so fast that by the time it's corrected or taken down, like it's too late, people already saw that and the impression has already been made. Like that's just another added factor of how difficult it is to educate in this new reality of social media, of technology, artificial intelligence, all these things. So um, truly, truly wild stuff. I think about all the videos that you and I have, Jeff. This is episode 100. That's 100 episodes. Each episode is like an hour and some change. That's like hundreds of hours of our faces looking at the camera, speaking, saying things. And it seems like it'd be pretty easy to make deep fakes out of that based on what they did for this principle. So for our listeners and viewers, if you ever see video or hear audio of me saying such things as like, Oh, I love standardized testing. I think we should test students more. <laughs> or No Child Left Behind was uh, uh, um, just a, a, a legendary and very impactful moment in education, and we need to get back to those roots. If you ever see or hear me saying anything like that, one of me, one of me. I'm a, I'm a quote Shaggy here. It won me. So the landscape and what this looks like down the line. Truly, truly troubling, truly terrifying. But of course, the underlying, underlying issue here about the racism and racist behavior at the school site and the response to this video, you know, we're never going to be able to outpace technology. We're never going to be able to get to a place where, like, we are able to confront this technology before the damage is done. So it just reminds me of the fundamental importance of teaching with love, teaching with emphasis on community and having humanizing spaces and making it so that if a few bad actors put out a video like this, enough people in the school and the community and students seeing the video would know that must be fake because that's not the person, like just really emphasizing that part because yeah, man, the, the potential for damage here, the potential for destroying careers, but more importantly, just like traumatizing folks and just like really tearing apart the fabric of a school community. Yeah, that potential is very strong and this is really troubling stuff. Yeah, yeah, uh, it is. It's deeply scary, man, uh, the potential for this kind of stuff. And, you know, in as much as kids mess up and, it, you know, this is this is a problem. I, you know, there is a very real question here about like, what is the extent of the harm that can be done with this kind of thing? And what's the right sort of uh, consequence, you know, for doing that level of harm uh, for young people? Now, I generally definitely tend to fall on the side of the equation that's like, let's not incarcerate our youth and let's not, you know, over criminalize our youth. Right. Uh, but but like this is a huge, huge problem. Right. Um, and so. I certainly hope. I don't necessarily hold out great confidence, given the track record of, you know, of America generally, and this, this, what, what it sounds like has been a long-standing issue uh, in this particular community, uh, you know, among many other communities in this country. But um, you know, I certainly hope that this is a wake-up call for them. That uh, you know, kids are not born. <laughs> that way, right? To make this sort of video, or right? these are learned behaviors coming from somewhere, and so you know these are very like troubling seeds that have been planted, and I hope they can they can be really proactive, you know, in addressing this and and kind of laying down the the uh, the messaging that like this is unacceptable in our school in our community. We're going to be better than and different than this. Yeah, for sure, for sure. All right, folks, that was the first story. Not a great one, at least not um, a hopeful, uplifting story. Not that one. What do we got next, Jeff? What's next for today's lexicon? Well, our next term, Manuel, uh, first of all, I'm going to give you a hint because I know sometimes these terms, you know, it's a little, uh, it's a little intense, uh, you know, early in the morning when we record. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this, this term comes to us from the great state of Texas. Okay, hint, hint. Uh, okay. And the term is football. Ah, football. Texas, a state that loves its football, but has not produced any football champions in quite a while, either at the college <laughs> or professional level. No offense to those in Texas who are football fans, but um, this Californian over here has feelings, has thoughts. So we're talking football, Jeff. This is not a sports podcast, but I am more than happy to talk football. I'm more than happy to talk about how my San Francisco 49ers have um, beat the Cowboys and kicked them out of the playoffs two years in a row now. We could definitely talk about that. 
<laughs> we, we could talk about that. Uh, I, I will say, though, uh, if memory serves, Manuel, uh, the, the, at least at the college level, the state of Texas uh, might have a more recent national champion than the state of California. Let's get to the story, Jeff. Uh, we got it. We got and, it. The clock is ticking. This dude now is taking too long, Jeff. Let's get the to the story. The University of Southern California, uh, your favorite school, in, in winning that I'm here that for education takes, Jeff. I'm here to learn uh, and expand our knowledge <laughs> about the world of education. So... so you know, as as they might say in Texas, man. Well, you mess with the bull, you you get the horns. Okay, uh, <laughs> hook them, hook them horns or whatever they do. Uh, I I, hope, I don't know if I did that right. Um, okay, all that to say, Manuel. Uh, of course, football in the great state of Texas is uh, a religion, um, right behind Christianity as the second biggest religion. Uh, one one might argue, and um, that's not what we're talking about at all. We are talking about uh, a political. <laughs> Football, Manuel, political football, which is also, let's be real, very Texas. So True. let's get into this story, Manuel. This uh, comes to us from NBC News by Daniela Silva. Uh, and Texas just recently announced a state takeover of the Houston Public School District, the state's largest and the eighth largest in the country, which serves about 200,000 students. The move will replace Houston's democratically elected school board and superintendent with a board of managers appointed by the Texas Education Agency, which is, of course, under the direction of Governor Greg Abbott and the Texas Republicans. Experts told NBC News that research on previous district takeovers has shown no significant gains in student performance and even some declines. Quote, we find no evidence that on average uh, state takeovers improve academic achievement and found evidence that it can be kind of disruptive on average in the early years, said, excuse me, Beth Schuler, an assistant professor of education and public policy at the University of Virginia. The research also showed that districts that served larger populations of black students were more likely to be the target of a takeover, regardless of academic performance. Houston Independent School District is about 22% black and about 60% Latino. Now, Governor Abbott's Education Commissioner, Mike Morath, said in a letter to the school board and the superintendent that the board of managers was being appointed because one of the district's campuses, quote, received unacceptable academic accountability ratings for five consecutive years, and because the district has had a conservator assigned for more than two consecutive years. Now, Manuel, um, I don't even know what to say necessarily about this one, but uh, for whatever reason, in, in the state of Texas, where Greg Abbott is a vicious racist, where the Texas Republican Party uh, is, you know, declaring outright war on black and brown communities through an educational lens and many other lenses as well. Let's, let's keep it 100 here on our 100th episode. Uh, they are now taking control of the largest school district that serves primarily black and brown students under the auspices of being able to do a better job than the locally elected representatives. I have some questions. I have some thoughts. I have some wonderings. Uh, I am curious what yours are <laughs> hearing this story, Manuel. Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, I'm not in Texas. I'm not in Houston, and I don't know any educators off the top of my head who are working in Houston. So I got to front load this by all, just front load all this by saying like, I understand that there's probably way more going on here than what is reported in this story and what's been reported in the news about this takeover. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not gonna assume to know like what's really going on and what the par parents feel, but I, I tried to do some searching to see how the community's reacting to this takeover. And one, uh, somebody labeled a community activist was speaking about how this district has failed black and brown students for so long. And there's been um, an indictment and corruption at the board level and teachers have having to spend their own money to support their students and you know something has to be done we can't just keep going like this and i'm thought oh yeah that's that's reasonable and thoughtful and you could probably say that for a lot of large districts unfortunately and then i saw you know other videos where other folks uh, uh state rep ron reynolds was was pointing out that this is a white republican takeover and that just the things you just said jeff about the who's up at the top here uh governor abbott and, and what they've already done and what they've already shown as their priorities for education um is that we can't trust them to take care of this district or to take to take care of our black and brown uh students so um it's one of those things where there's probably 
legitimately um, some issues going on where students are being underserved. I think that is uh, something that we could point to too many districts most districts, maybe all districts, where marginalized students in particular are being underserved and deserve better. Um, but this ain't the leadership that I trust to offer better. Like, I just don't trust this state leadership based on what I know about Abbott and what we've reported on on this show. I don't trust them as being the ones to do better for, for the young people in those classrooms. So um, I definitely, definitely think this is something to worry about if you are a, a parent or a community member in Houston and Governor Abbott, the same one that on this show, we had a story about how he wants to have these pamphlets and the DMVs that give this whitewashed version of Texas history. And Abbott obviously had an abysmal response to the uh, massacre in Uvalde. And Abbott has gone on and on targeting uh, anything related to race and, and gender in Texas. So like, I want to trust any. I want to trust him, obviously, or anybody that he selects uh, for in, within the Texas Educational Agency to have anything to do with transforming this district and doing better by marginalized students. I just wouldn't trust that at all. So I've been at a school before that was being threatened with state takeover. And I remember folks from the county coming in with their clipboards and, and what they expected to see and this real robotic uh, method of teaching that they were expecting from us. I know state takeovers, generally speaking, don't really do much to move the needle for um, outcome educational outcomes for our most marginalized students. So that in general, I, I don't really like that as a, a way to to do right by our students, but I especially don't like it if the state takeover is being led by state officials who are of the of the uh, ilk of Governor Greg Abbott. Yeah, Manuel, I um, I think there's a lot uh, in what you just said there, and um, I th I think it's important to point out that two things can be true at once, right? The local officials in Houston, the superintendent, the school board, the, you know, the mayor, or other political officials that may have some sway over the kind of educational policy agenda that's there, they could have failed, right? And repeatedly not done what needed to be done to support success and ensure high quality services being delivered to the students and families in Houston. That might very well be true. Like you, I'm not, you know, an expert on local education politics and history in Houston. I've heard a few things over the years and whatnot. And I, I will I will even stipulate to say like, yeah, there, you know, like many big districts, there are some problems uh, going on there, right? Um, and there are certainly some schools within that system that have been deeply underserved for a long time. That can be true, and it can be true that a governor and a uh, right-wing hack appointed to head the State Education Commission uh, and whatever people they're going to put in charge of stuff can absolutely not only be unqualified to better lead the Houston public school system, uh, but could also be coming in with malicious intent, frankly, as they have demonstrated through their belief systems, the policies that they push at a state level. So, you know, that, frankly, for families that are stuck in tough situations in Houston is a is a tough lose-lose, you know, set of options to have to consider in that sense. But certainly we have very, very limited evidence that I am aware of, at least across the country, Manuel, either with education or in other examples. Think Flint, Michigan. Think Detroit, Michigan. Right. Other places around the country where, you know, these Republican legislatures come in and are supposed to supposed to make things better and wind up literally poisoning uh, you know, or yeah. stealing all the money from the very people that they're supposedly, you know, going to come in and like whip the system into shape to serve the community better. So I think we have zero reason to expect anything other than potential harm to come from this, frankly. And, you know, maybe it'll be like six and one, half dozen the other. But like, what reason do we have to think that that these officials are any more qualified, uh, you know, technically knowledgeable, experienced, right. whatever, you know, to be able to do a good job at this. The reality is, man, well, I'm going to say this, a cold reality in our system is that your path to success from, you know, sort of classroom to district leadership to county leadership to state leadership has nothing to do with your ability to be like a, a you know, a really successful turnaround school system leader. Okay. It has much more to do with, you know, your ability to kind of 
climb the ranks and, you know, and play politics and these sorts of things. And I don't say that to dismiss people that have done that. I'm just saying like, these are very different jobs. Being a county administrator that, you know, or a state administrator that effectively like puts in place accountability structures for local school systems to make sure they're spending dollars in the right way or auditing them and these sorts of things is very different than figuring out how to effectively change culture and practice and run schools in underserved communities in Houston. So, I, you know, I would say, you know, my thoughts go out to the families in Houston because uh, what's we should expect that what's coming is a regime that intends to do harm. Um, to our youth. And so, you know, I hope folks there, you know, maybe they feel differently about it. Maybe there's more of a sense of optimism, but, uh, you know, I hope they're, they're doing what they can to organize and show strength in the face of a regime that, that we have no evidence to suggest means us anything but harm. Yeah. A thousand percent. I agree with that. And, um, man, deep fakes and state takeovers. There's just, just love and solidarity with all the educators, all the parents, all the students, first and foremost, in, in these districts across the nation who are just trying their best to get an education and to be able to live as healthy and free humans. Like, shout out to everybody out there doing the best they can because uh, these education streets, they be tough, man. They be tough. So, um, you know. It, it, I think, is worthwhile to have a conversation in our seminar coming up next with uh, Lorena Herman about just the impact of teaching in these times, especially these really politically fraught times where there's these open attacks on really our being, on, on our personhood. So um, that's going to come up in our seminar. Stay tuned for that. But that about does it for this episode's Do Now. All right, seminar up next. Stay tuned. Hey folks, thanks so much for tuning in to All The Above. We really appreciate you. And as you know, All The Above is a small operation. It's just me and just Manuel, that's it. We have no sponsorships, which means we are totally dependent on our amazing audience to help support the show. So here's what you can do. Go to our website, which is aotashow.com slash support. That's aotashow.com slash support. There you can find links to everything you can do to support the show. You find all the links to every platform that we're on where you can like, subscribe, follow, make sure you share our show with your whole network. Also, you can donate there. We are on Venmo, we're on Cash App, and most importantly, you can find the link to our Anchor page where you can become a monthly patron. Even a small donation once a month will make a huge difference in helping us continue to produce the show. Lastly, you can find there the link to get your flyest, best, latest, all the above show merch. Okay, all you gotta do is go to aotashow.com slash support. Thanks, enjoy the rest of the show. All right, folks, welcome to today's seminar. Thanks so much for joining us. And we are thrilled and excited to have back with us a guest we had about one year ago to talk to us at that time about her new book, Textured Teaching, which is still available out there uh, for those who may be interested. Um, but today we're having her back to, I guess, continue the conversation about anti-racist education and creating the kinds of learning conditions that marginalized students need and deserve in schools, but more specifically, doing so through the lens of what is happening in the state of Florida. So with us today is educator, author, uh, activist, amazing uh, um, scholar in our profession, Lorena Herman. Welcome back to All the Above. Thanks, y'all. Thanks for having me back. It's been a year already? Yeah, yep. it's been about a year. Yep. Oh, wow. yep. Okay. <laughs> Time flies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. All right, folks, let me tell you a little bit more about our guest. Uh, Lorena Herman is a Dominican-American educator focused on anti-racist and anti bias work in education. She earned her master's degree at Middlebury College's Breadloaf School of English. She's a two-time nationally awarded educator who has been featured in newspapers and journals such as the New York Times, NCTE Journals, Ed Week, and the National Writing Project, as well as Embracing Equity. 
She previously published the Anti-Racist Teacher Reading Instruction Workbook and now has a forthcoming book, uh, no longer forthcoming, uh, a book that is out uh, titled Textured Teaching, a Framework for Culturally Sustaining Practices, which explores curriculum development focused on social justice. She's a co-founder of Disrupt Text and Multicultural Classroom. Additionally, she is the Director of Pedagogy at Educolor and is also the Chair of the National Council of Teachers of English. Uh, Committee Against Racism and Bias in the Teaching of English. Welcome back, Lorena, and I'm going to kick it over to Manuel for our first question. Yeah, yeah we got Educolor back in the building, mm -hmm. multicultural classroom in the building. Thank you, Lorena Herman, for being here with us um, yet again on all of the above. And, you know, we... Our, our show is produced in California, and like a lot of educators, we are outside of Texas. Uh, I mean, sorry, outside of Florida. Both, really. <laughs> conflating them, conflating them, and that's that's a thing right there. Uh, um, yeah. But yeah, you know, we're on the outside looking at what's happening, and it just seems like a constant bombardment of story after story after story, attack after attack after attack um, in Florida on on just everything. So, like first and foremost, we just want to ask you, how are you doing, and how are how are educators in Florida holding up under this constant these constant attacks on on really who we are? Yeah, I mean, I saw that question and I was like, how am I? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, you know it's it's so hard to answer that because yeah. am i am i okay do i know that we've been here before as a nation do i right is this just another moment to endure yet again right is this is this just another opportunity as a person and woman of color and an immigrant in this nation to say yep i know you don't want me here i know you don't want to talk about me i know that you know my presence in and of itself is politicized and an exercise of resistance right like okay i guess um, so in that sense, it's exhausting, right? In that sense, it's frustrating. Um, it's enraging. And it's also um, it's also validating in some ways, um, in the sense that like this is why so many of us have been talking about this, right? Because this was right underneath the surface. Uh, it did not take us a very long time to get here. The the anti-CRT movement, let's call it, started in 2021. I mean, it's just 2023 and look at where we're at. Look at how quickly all of this legislation has, has rolled out all across the country, right? And then some states like Florida decided, hold my beer, I got this, right? And, and they've gone even deeper. But look at how quickly... Look at how quickly we got to the point where saying, no, the content in this course, for example, in the AP one, it has no educational value, right? Um, and, and that's why uh, we, those of us, like the two of you who've been talking about a lot of these issues in education for many years, for decades, have been talking about it. This is why. Because we could see it and we could feel it and we could read it. And we can, you know, we were teaching it uh, because all of these people were students, just a couple decades ago, right? Um, or one decade ago, maybe even. And so um, here we are. It, it's it's not um, super unsurprising. Um, and yet it's also like, wow, but really though? Um, and so it's a constant state of confusion, bewilderment, um, you know, frustration. And then there's moments where you see like, people are resisting. People are like, no, this is absurd. And that part is encouraging, right? And, and to see people saying, we're gonna have to do our own thing. Whatever that means, that part is beautiful too. So how am I, it's all of that. It's all of that, you know, it's yeah. all of that. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Lorena. And, um, you know, it is, it's hard, I think, for uh, those of us who are outside of that political landscape, perhaps to fully appreciate the the risks involved in in just being and advocating for the things that you know folks like yourself are advocating for and and the danger that has perhaps been introduced into the workplace uh in a way that most of us you know in in other contexts like 
really have not had to walk, uh, you know, in that way. And so I guess I, I one, just want to say, I appreciate you sharing, you know, how things are going and that you're, you know, the fact that you are here and still vertical is a testament to, your, you know, to your fortitude. Um, and, you know, and also just appreciate the work that you're continuing to do in that context. Um, because I, you know, our, our struggles are connected, I think. Um, to, to pivot slightly, I want to um, ask this next question by also starting with just some context to make sure we sort of bring everyone into the loop on exactly what we're talking about in terms of the, you know, some of the repressive things that have been happening in the state of Florida. So to get a little more specific, Governor Ron DeSantis and the Republican legislature in Florida have passed uh, bills um, over the last couple of years that have fundamentally altered uh, the landscape of the workplace and what discourse, curricula, um, and materials can be used in the state of Florida. This includes things like book bans, bans on ideas like critical race theory, the 1619 Project, uh, bans on workplace diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings, um, and even on discussions that suggest America is inherently racist or discussions of historical topics to make uh, white people uh, ostensibly uncomfortable. Um, more recently, as you noted, the governor had a pretty high profile, or his administration had a pretty high profile, high profile exchange with the college board uh, around the new AP African American Studies course, which as you said, uh, you know, essentially said a huge swaths of modern African American history and political organizing have no educational value. So in that context, um, how would you say that these laws are impacting, you know, educators at uh, school sites? Um, you know, your experience and also folks, you know, in, in other parts of the state. Whew, um, yeah, <laughs> it's a lot because there are so many different things to consider. Um, something that I want to say before I even jump in, I appreciate, you know, the two of you being outside as you as you kind of framed it, like you're outside of the state looking in. And I appreciate you taking the time to allow someone who's in this state to talk about it, because I think, you know, there's there's so much talk on social media, almost on every single social media post that I see that's talking about something to do in Florida. Folks in the comments are like, get rid of Florida. They voted for him. You know, let them deal with it. And there's this negative talk um, about people in the state of Florida as if all of us voted for him, as if all of us support this, right? So that's that's one, because I know and remember and understand what it was like when other countries looked at the United States, when you know who was president, right? Talking about, well, they elected him. No, they didn't elect him, right? Like a big group of yeah. people did, but everybody here didn't elect him. So you should all go down with this country because of him, right? And so in the same way, the state of Florida did not fully elect him. In fact, some of the um, statistics show that a lot of the people on school boards throughout different districts in the state that were identifying with him and some that he endorsed were not elected in their communities. So you've got a number of people who are kind of with DeSantis, but not necessarily with his educational agenda, which is a really important distinction, I think, um, when you start noticing the way um, and who the way these these bans are happening and the way these policies are getting pushed throughout different districts, it's always a small group of let's call them vocal parents. Right. It's a small group of people who are like, I've got this agenda and I'm going to fight till the end of it. And it's not a big conglomerate of people. It's not a whole community. It's like these three you know, white moms who are part of Moms for Liberty, for example. And I want to say that in the context of what I'm about to say, because these these bans and these policies are affecting different people in different ways. You've got, you know, Florida is one of the, the, the states in the United States with the largest homeschooling population. And so that group of people, right, cares differently about these bans. They care, but it's different. The way that it's impacting them is different because a number of them are using that as validation for their choices. A number of them are using that to say, well, you know, that's why I left public school, right? Because they believe the indoctrination thing. And so like, you know, this is now better 
This is this is what it should be. So like there's these pockets in there. And within homeschooling in Florida specifically, you have a large and growing, booming population of parents of color who are homeschooling. And so they're seeing these policies and saying they're the ones that are like, yeah, that's why my kids are not in school. Right. Because of this, because we saw this coming, because we know that this has been happening already. And now it's just state sponsored. Right. So you've got that group of people and they're a voting body, obviously. And so they matter. You've got teachers who are in public schools because teachers in in like inner city public schools are not experiencing this the same way as teachers in suburban public schools. Right. Or in rural public schools, because it's in suburbia and in rural places where you're seeing the most of this, quote unquote, activism. Right. This is where you're seeing a lot of the bans. You don't see a lot of this happening in state in cities like mine in Tampa or in Orlando or in Miami as much. Because these are parents of color who are like, yeah, I understand. This is this is what you're teaching, right? Like this is real history, and so they are supportive of this, generally speaking. Um, and so, you know, that's one thing. Then you've got the pockets of educators at public at private schools, right? A number of the private schools in Florida, like the majority of them, are actually faith based schools, and so they are, you know. Kind of, it depends on the school because some are progressive and some are not. And I use, you know, quotation marks because I don't really think they are, but whatever. That's how, how some of them identify. Um, but, you know, they are, are obviously, generally speaking, in support of the idea of, yeah, we need to have tempered and moderate conversations and we've got to hear the both sides and, right? Like they're not necessarily wanting to adopt those bands because they know it looks bad, <laughs> But they are wanting to have those middle ground civil conversations instead of what they have been told happens. Right. They're believing this narrative of like, oh, well, white kids are made to feel this. And, you know, black kids through CRT are told that they are that. Um, right. And, and, and they just don't know. There's a whole lot of miseducation around this state. As I talk to parents, as I talk to educators, right, like there's just a lot um there's just a lot of misunderstanding of what, of what these bills actually say and what they mean um, and how they're supposed to show up in classrooms. And so it just creates a lot of chaos and confusion and then people who don't know what to do. <laughs> right. And so what you have then are teachers who prior to this were already hesitant. They were already like, ooh, how do I talk about this? Do I teach this? And then this has become their reason to say, I'm not touching it, I'm not touching it with a 10 foot pole. And so in that sense, yeah, anti-racist and anti-bias education has certainly um, diminished, you know, but then you have places who are like, we've been about this work even before any of these policies. And all we're going to do is change the language that needs to be changed so that we can continue to do our work. We're going to be about our business, you know? Um, I know that for me, um, there's one school in particular that is like, love them and fully support their work. Um, I'm not going to say, you know, I'm not going to identify anything, but we, we usually have to change a lot of our language. They're like, we're going to keep doing this. Um, so let's figure out what words we're going to use. Um, we can't say multicultural. So that means we can't say it was your organization, right? So like there's, there's all these games that we play and we're still going to do the work, but you know, it just... Uh, Tony Morrison said it best. Racism is a distraction, right? It pulls us away from the actual work that we have to do. So instead of spending all this not, you know, this time doing this nonsense of don't use this word, use that word, right? Don't describe it this way. Use Florida best standards, right? Like use this other stuff. It just takes this effort. It just takes this time that could have been spent on just anything else, literally, you know? And so, yeah, I mean, it just, <laughs> there's, it's, it's really complicated in that sense in terms of how it's playing out. And then you've got educators at the higher ed level who are watching all of this, knowing like this is headed our way ASAP. In fact, there's already been bills, right, um, um, pushed to, to target specifically higher ed. And so, you know, for, for a number of them, particularly historians and folks in sociology and folks in education, who have the history, who have the research, who know about the ways that education has evolved and the way literacy specifically began in this nation and has continued until this day are like, hey, we see the patterns, right? Like we've been here before, we know where this is going. Um, and so their, their voices are really important, particularly in this state right now in kind of showing um, these connections, 
these connections. Like I just shared an article on Twitter earlier today from a, an educator here in California. She's at, um, sorry, not California, that's y'all, here in Florida. She's an educator here uh, in Florida. I think it's at UCF, University of Central Florida. And she made direct connections between these anti, what she's calling anti-literacy laws and slave codes and black codes. Mm. And she's like, wow. it's the same, right here, it's right here. She drew a direct line. And I was just like, that's it. That's it. You know? Yeah. I, I love the, I love that you helped us see just the complex, like really the diversity of, of experiences across Florida when it relates to this issue. Because again, like a lot of the discussion from folks outside of Florida, you know, painting broad strokes across across the school system, across educators, across the state, when in reality, it, it looks so different depending on uh, what city, what state, uh, what part of the state you're in and, and what your context is. So like the homeschooling aspect, the private schooling aspect, um, those who go to school in Tampa, in, in Miami, and just the, the diversity of experiences underneath these these attacks and and so many of these attacks seem really targeted on educators ability to like teach marginalized students um, in culturally and historically responsive ways. And of course, not all of our marginalized students have the privilege of being able to go to a private school or being able to uh, be homeschooled. So uh, we're re really wondering if you could shed some light on how you see this impacting our most marginalized students as they are trying their best to get their education and, and grow and, and, and become part of our society underneath these attacks that are, that are so clearly um, limiting what they have access to in terms of what they can actually learn and explore in their in their educational context. Right. Oh my goodness. Um, you know, one of the the two major bills, the Stop Woke Act HB, what is that? HB fifteen fifty seven, I think, and the the um, Don't Say Gay Bill, the HB seven. The two of them work hand in hand, right, to target. Um, one targets the teaching of and the history of marginalized folks, right? And issues of race. And the other one is like, we're not going to talk about anything that has to do with gender and sexuality. So it's very much targeting, <laughs> like literally, let's call them everybody else, right? Other than white folks. But one of the toxicities of white supremacy or one of the ways that it harms is that it's not just something that hurts the people it impacts. It also hurts and harms the people who perpetrate it. And so this legislation is for sure harming our students of color and our LGBTQ identifying students, right? For sure, because now we are erased. Now we are told we don't belong. And so if my stories don't belong, well then of course I don't belong, right? Like I shouldn't be who and how I am. And the things that I'm being told at home are now something that I should discredit, right? Like I shouldn't believe Abuela's story of what happened, right? I shouldn't believe what my grandpa said it was like to be in Jim Crow, Florida, right? Like, I don't know, because now that is in conflict with what school is telling me which is absolutely, it is absolutely a, uh, an effort or a continuation of the cultural genocide present during assimilation schools. That's exactly how that functioned, okay? So that's what I mean when I say we've been here before as a nation. Like every single one of our groups has been through the experience of what I'm going to use, um, Dr. Kathleen, I can't remember her last name. Um, you know, the article that I was reading, she's calling them anti-literacy laws. And I think that that's really the best way to think of them because we, we often just think about literacy in terms of reading and writing. And that is most definitely a part of literacy, but there's also racial literacy, right? There's also anti-bias literacy. And so these are courses that we're actually equipping our students of color to be able to say, not only do I understand what is happening around me, but now I have the literacy to actually try to do something about it. And so to quell that type of um, disruption is the goal of these anti-literacy laws. And so what we're saying is, hey, students, hey, marginalized students, not only do I not want you to see the depravity of your conditions, but I certainly don't want you to do anything about it. I want you to shut up and like it. And what happens to white students in the process is that they are watching this and they're saying, hmm, am I supposed to be on their side? Because then I, I'm going to become the enemy of all of these people. And all of these people are supposed to be like my parents, right? <laughs> my, my community folks. And so they get put into these positions, which is not, I'm not trying to compare. I'm just talking about like 
the way that this is harming everybody involved, because then they are going to be the ones that have to sustain that and deal with the repercussions of these anti-literacy laws later. Because these are going to be their colleagues. These are going to be their PTA partners, right? These are going to be their, their uh, you know, employers and employees. And so now they are going to have to continue facing each other in the face of this legislation that is meant to actually separate them. And so white students then, right, understandably, and I think rightfully so, develop a certain rage. I'm talking about the good rage, the one that showed up in 2020 when all them white kids was out in the street saying this was wrong. Y'all lied to us. That's the rage I'm talking about. Right. And that rage is going to keep coming back because these anti-literacy laws are surely against us. But it's they think for their children to protect them. But really what they're trying to do is protect their status, protect their supremacy. A thing that these these young white people, when they become older, are going to be like, man, I, I have to keep dealing, right? I have to keep dealing and facing the reality of what my ancestors keep doing to sustain this racism and this white supremacy. We're going to stay here. We're going to stay in this vicious racist cycle until white folks decide that, you know, uh, being on top of it all ain't worth it. Mm. Yeah, it, it's such well, an important <laughs> reminder. Uh, I think you're giving us about the, you know, the oppressive effects of both uh, suffering under, <laughs> you know, the, the yoke of oppression and the oppressive effects of being the oppressor. Uh, right. And although it might manifest in different ways, uh, it is toxic, uh, yeah. you know, on both sides of the equation. And so I, I very much appreciate that. Um, Lorena, I have seen, you know, a few glimpses of this on Twitter over, you know, the last uh, number of months, um, you and other folks, uh, you know, doing some organizing or uh, doing some things to support educators uh, in Florida specifically, but, uh, you know, I'd say states like Florida, there are probably a dozen or so others around the country that are, that are very much dealing with, you know, similar laws now on the books. Um, but doing things to organize in, you know, in opposition and resistance. And so uh, wonder if you can share with us, uh, you know, I'm not saying give away the, you know, the keys to the resistance or anything here, but share with us what you can uh, about, you know, how you, how other educators are, are organizing in response to these draconian laws. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can't, um, I want to protect the, strategies right from from right because we don't know who's gonna watch this and and we want it to be right. our friends but we also know that you know there's people out there who have ill intention and etc so um what i can say is is that a lot of the work is forcing is or, or the the political context is forcing us to move a lot of the work outside of the school building um, which is, which is, I think good and bad, right? Like the bad piece of it is that it's hard to now institutionalize this, right? Like now it's hard to institutionalize a sense of justice, working for justice in our schools. So there's that piece and moving it outside of the building also is going to, and has, um, created like a sense of thirst and drive for the work. Because people are more and more understanding, like, not only do I really have to do this, but now I have to do all of this to do it, right? So it's like, my goodness, this really is so powerful. Um, and so, yeah, we've, we've been moving it outside of the building. It is more on teachers' hands um, to have to seek these things out, to, to um, ask for help. And so that part is really hard because... Um, there aren't a lot of networks for this, for this type of work, right? Like teachers don't necessarily have a forum where they can say, hey, where can I get access to ABC, right? If they're not part of social media in that kind of way. Um, so that, that part has been challenging. Yeah, we've been doing efforts at different, with different people and places, trying to get resources into teachers' hands. Um, that's kind of been our first approach because we know that materials cost money and now they are not going to get school support and funding to, to acquire them. Um, but if they want to, it should be accessible, right? Like 
money shouldn't be what stops someone from being able to teach about anti-bias and anti-racism. So, um, and so, right. So we're, we're doing that. Um, also, um, trying to use social media for two things. One of the things that we've been doing at multicultural classroom, one is encouragement for sure, right? Like you're not alone. We're in this together. That, that type of, um, you know, that type of messaging. But then also one of the struggles that, that a lot of teachers are having that I've been in contact with throughout the United States and especially in Florida is, is, um, you know, what I'm calling clapbacks, but essentially it's like, how do I argue? How do I know to argue that the things I'm doing are right? I'm not crazy because the gaslighting is real in a lot of these places. Um, right. And the fear of the one parent email, showing up or the parents showing up to the school board because of the book you assigned. And so, you know, we've been creating material and, and I mean, videos and like resources for teachers to use that argumentation, um, even if it's for their own packet, right? Like if that argument comes, boom, a prepared teacher is a more effective teacher. And so if a teacher is like, I can argue for this book, even if I don't know if it's going to come my way, I'm going to walk into that lesson more confidently into that classroom, into that school building, being like, I got this. Right. And that's the kind of boldness and courage that we need right now, too. And it is it, it, not to say that teachers don't, but it is understandably scary. Right. To know that if I teach that book or if somebody says something about me, I could lose my job. Or if I was somewhere else. Well, here in Florida. Right. Like certain things are a felony. <laughs> you know, so I think it's OK to admit Right. Like it's OK to admit that you are afraid because this is your livelihood and we're already underpaid as is. And so, you know, that's OK to admit it. And I think that it's it's very helpful to to offer people resources in order to do the work. If, if they're like, I'm going to do it. It's like, it's like there should be a whole the whole nation should be like, we got your back. Instead of y'all voted for DeSantis. So let's just chop Florida off. <laughs> you know? Yeah. For real, for real. And I've been saying it and a, a lot of others have been saying it too. Like, yeah. this is something, I mean, we should really be in the streets over this. When you really think about what's happening, when you really think about the fact that books are being banned, books are being banned and whole curriculum providers are modifying their curriculum to not violate Florida law and the impact that that's having on what curriculum is out there for folks who aren't in Florida. Like, we should be in the streets over this. So I, I very much appreciate you sharing the resistance that that um, is happening at the moment in Florida and reminding us that this isn't some old like, oh, you know, sucks for Florida. Like they should go somewhere like, no, this is this is an American problem. This is not um, in any way confined and contained to just Florida, really, in any way. And, and here's um, the thing, Manuel, like you just yeah. said something really important um, or something that made me think of something that was really important. But when you think of the demographics, right, of just the country. You've got a certain demographic that is still watching the news on TV, right? Like cable TV. You've got other folks who are getting their news from social media sources or are just on their phone, right? And they're reading articles or whatever. Um, and the news that these demographics are getting are different. So when I talk to a bunch of the folks that I know, right, who are maybe just parents in, in Florida public schools, and even private schools that are kind of like in my window between 30 and, you know, late 40s, let's say, between 30 and 50, right? They are not all very clear. They understand that some of this is wrong, but they struggle to articulate. And they're trying to understand, well, where is this coming from? Why? Et cetera. And so you have this miseducation and misunderstanding um, to, to even how to resist. I wish I was seeing more resistance in the state of Florida. Um, one of the ways that they resist is through voting, but we also know that there's tons of efforts to dif disenfranchise voters, right? Yeah. And so voting is a huge deal in the state of Florida. People vote, they come out and vote. Um, and so they, so they, they make political statements with their vote, which is great. Um, and we also just are lacking a lot of true and correct information. And one of the things that DeSantis is really good at is manipulating language, right? He knows how to say the things like I, he was, he was just, he did a press, whatever, I don't know when, I think it was right after his, um, his election. And he said something like, I don't remember what the question was and he didn't really answer it well, but I remember listening and, and him saying, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Woke comes to Florida 
no, Florida is where woke comes to die. And I was like, that literally means nothing, but it's the perfect sound bite. <laughs> it yeah. is the perfect yeah. sound bite. Yeah. And then he goes on to say, which he has repeated in multiple places, that, you know, we want education, not indoctrination. And I was like, that is also <laughs> wrong and it sounds perfect. And so those types, right, like at first, at first listening, if you are not well versed in education and understanding all of this, you're like, yeah, I mean, I, I also don't want indoctrination, right? Indoctrination sounds bad. I do want education. So you might be, so you might be like, huh, I wonder, and you're not outright rejecting it. And it's that, that sliver of possibility that he is preying on and that his people are preying on. And that's part of what happens, right? And, and that's why we're not seeing as much objection as we are on the streets, you know, but we are, you know, but there are groups that are organizing. There are protests. I just wish that, um, you know, all the people <laughs> that did not vote for him, uh, would get up and, and that we would collectively make a stand, you know, hmm. Lorena, you're, yeah. you're making me think of, uh, a rem reminisce on, I think this was from eyes on the prize, the, you know, civil rights, um, mm -hmm. documentary series. I, I might have that wrong, but I think there's a, there's a clip on one of the episodes of the late, uh, Bob Moses, who, um, you know, grew up in New York state and, traveled down to Mississippi to, you know, work on voter registration and, and you know, the, the various community-led movements to, to sort of break down this very, uh, you know, horrific Jim Crow political structure. And he talked about some of the uh, kind of critiques that, that people would offer, like, why are you going to Mississippi? Mississippi is like, you know, the outlier, you know, maybe you should go to you know, Virginia or like somewhere where it's like easier to, you know, to do the work or more representative of the rest of America or something. And I, and I'm just, I remember him saying something to the effect of like, people talk about Mississippi, like it's not America. And right. he's like, no, Mississippi is America. It's super America. Like it, it is, it is the clearest embodiment of the problems that we actually have in almost every corner of, of this country. And, uh, you know, albeit a different, obviously, uh, context in some ways. I think there might be a lesson in there that, that, you're, you know, that you're calling out that's important that is like the, the presence of this issue in Florida is not a Florida problem. It's not something that should comfort us because look right. how progressive our little city or town or whatever is in our corner of the country. It's that this, you know, and hey, we we might very well see this in a very, very real way as Ron DeSantis launches. In 2024, yeah. he's about to be <laughs> everybody's problem. Right, right. But even if that doesn't happen, you know, or he doesn't win the nomination or that sort of thing, you know, this, this is, uh, you know, maybe a cancer analogy, right? That like, we can't be good that like there's cancer in the foot, but the rest of the body right. is okay. Exactly. Like it's, it spreads and it is a collective problem. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, I really appreciate you speaking on that, that like we might have different school systems and different laws and these sorts of things, but the, but the presence of this type of injustice anywhere in our national educational landscape uh, has a harmful effect on all of us collectively and, and puts us all at risk. So um, I, I very much appreciate that message. Yeah, I'm definitely taking that analogy of cancer in the foot. That's perfect. <laughs> That's really perfect. Yeah. And, and you know, to your point, um, he is absolutely about to be everybody's problem, right? He is positioning his legislation and his work here in the state of Florida as a model for what can be done elsewhere. Um, and you already have states that would vote for him. We know that, right? Like we know that there are certain states who have already passed legislation. In fact, anti-CRT legislation was first passed in the state of Iowa. It wasn't even down here. Yeah. And so, you know, we already know that even in New York, there was someone who tried to pass a bill. It didn't pass, nothing happened, but they proposed it. So these folks are in a whole bunch of places. You know, Massachusetts, the hub of freedom, right? Um, they, there was a whole Trump voting population there and yeah. they've had Republican governors before. And so, you know, a lot of people like to look at the South and most certainly Florida right now as like these, these distant 
um, who are who are they and we're, they're not America. Like, no, this right here is America, all of it, right? Um, and and again, this was, we were just experiencing this as a whole nation in 2016, right? What if North America, what if Canada and Mexico were like, yo, we don't know them. Let's just cut yeah. the U.S. off <laughs> and throw them into the Pacific. We'd be like, wait a minute, right? We're going to get rid of every, even the people who didn't contribute to this, you know? Um, no. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that it's just, um, I understand where it comes from. Cause I, at times I'm like, oh my goodness, this state is driving me crazy. I get it. Right. Um, but I'm also very, very aware of the people who are suffering now and will be suffering later. The yeah. consequences of this legislation. No, absolutely. And even though we're, you know, Jeff and I are here in California, like it ain't all sweet out here either. Like there's two districts not too far from where, where I'm at that have already banned or have state board, uh, school boards, I should say, school boards who have banned CRT, one of them in Temecula and one of them in Orange County. Um, and we've discussed that on the show. So there's CRT bans happening locally in California. There's a, a beach city that's banned the pride flag from flying. So this is definitely, definitely not um, contained to just certain areas of the country. This is a little bit of this is everywhere and we all have to be um definitely cognizant in, of, of that reality and, and come together in this in this resistance to it before before it's too late so we, you know before we get out of here we do want to discuss one other um facet of this of the impacts of um these sorts of laws and, and efforts which is you know you yourself as a author and last time you were on the show we were talking about your book uh <laughs> texture teaching which you know we'll throw a link down under this video okay. again to <laughs> I, I still think this is the the dopest cover art for an education book. Like it's just so so dope. Um, Thank you. But yeah, you know you you're an author. You've provided PD. You've you know written uh, workbooks and 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 offered a lot of uh, support for teachers uh, in particular, teachers in particular to um, um, develop their pedagogy and make sure they're offering a culturally responsive pedagogy that um, you know serves our students well. And of course, these efforts also get in the way of that sort of PD, of, of folks like yourself and, and other um, authors and curriculum providers and PD providers from doing their work in areas where we have these bans. So we want to ask about what's the, what's the outlook for, for folks like you who's, who's practice and trying to help teachers and, and help schools move forward with their culturally responsive pedagogy. Um, you know, when, when you can't do that as, as freely as you were perhaps able to before the Stop Woke Act and all these other efforts that we've been discussing? Yeah, um, I mean, it's um, not encouraging, <laughs> I'll say yeah. that much. Um, and we are simply doing what we can to create opportunities for the teachers that want to, um, to find us and to work with us and for us to support them and to make it accessible and to make it meaningful and practical and encouraging. So um, we are not at this time working with many schools in the state of Florida for a couple of reasons. One, I'm not reaching out to schools in Florida. Um, a, I'm not trying to necessarily expose myself, if you will, right? Um, yeah. And I know that there's a lot of principals who are dealing with so many other issues, right? Like teacher shortage is really serious in Florida. Um, and you know, with the with the did y'all God in heaven? Did y'all hear about the the bill they passed? Talk about basically a warm body. That's all you need to be a teacher here. Okay, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if you if you're a, a military veteran or the spouse yeah. of, you can go teach. You don't even need certification. And so that's going to obviously create more work for administrators, right? Who now have to support you and help you and figure out what to do with the 25 kids, you know, th third graders in front of you because you have zero preparation or equipment for that. Um, so, you know, principals are just really understandably overwhelmed, um, particularly also for the amount of testing. Florida is not one of the top states in the country for their educational system and for the way that their students are, are doing. And the amount of standardized testing here is astronomical. It's one of the reasons. It's one of the two reasons I pulled my daughter out of public school. Um, I'm a huge public school supporter, and I wish, and we started at public school, but after one year, I was like, we cannot possibly um, uh, uh, put this on her, this much testing. And she was in first grade. <laughs> first grade. Hey. Um, and so I'm, I'm giving that context because I'm aware of the tensions that exist for principals and then for them to think, yeah, let's bring in multicultural classroom and get all this po potentially 
potentially all this negative attention from parents in our community, right? And questions and more work. So I understand that. Um, and so as a result, yeah, I mean, we're not, we are not at this time, like I said, working with many schools formally in the state. Um, we are doing a lot of work in many, many other states, but not here as much. Um, I am aware of, of educators who are um, and in conversation with educators who are still trying to do this work, still trying to get books in the hands of teachers, still trying to get them to attend things. But again, it's on their own. And so, you know, the the workshop cost three hundred and fifty dollars. Did you like can't do it? There's now no school funding for it, you know, because you can't allocate funds to these things, these workshops with these titles. Um, and so the prospects, you know, and that, that's not even my workshop. I'm not even, <laughs> even going to charge <laughs> for the teacher. I, you know, I'm talking about like, you know, companies, uh, uh, you know, larger companies training that they might offer in different states. But anyway, I, it, it makes for a very difficult context. These, these, these bills and this socio-political context is effectively um, really harming students by silencing and censoring their educators and instilling fear because that's really what's happening and it's ironic that one of the bills is called individual freedom <laughs> it's called in the, the stop woke act is in the, no the other one the don't say gay book it's called individual freedom clearly it's someone's individual freedom not everybody's yeah. individual yeah. freedom you know, there, there is a certain uh, like bond villain nature to <laughs> to uh, the folks on the right wing that is that is both, you know, horrific and also helpful in the sense that like, you know, they don't hide what uh, what harm they're trying right. to do. Sometimes they put it right in the title and tell, <laughs> tell you exactly, you know, what their what their plan is. So, uh, Lorena, um, it has been such a pleasure to have you back on the show. I uh, feel like we could keep going for, for hours here, but unfortunately, our, our time has come to an end. Um, before we go, though, I did just want to give you the opportunity, if, if folks out there are interested in uh, picking up a copy of your book, if they're interested in you know, connecting with you uh, about this you know, important work, if they're interested in supporting educators in Florida in some way, um, are there resources, information you'd like to, to put out into the, into the world here where folks can uh, connect with you or support your work or, or the work of, of folks, um, you know, doing good work in Florida? Yeah. Um, yes, there are. So first of all, they can obviously follow me on any social media and um, on these social medias, they can find ways to find links, you know, for the books. They can just find it on Amazon. Um, so that's the easy part. But in terms of how to support us here, there's a number there's a number of different things. There's an organization called Florida Rising, and they're doing a whole lot of the advocacy that we need on the streets. They're calling people to the streets and they're showing up at, you know, um, all of the, the houses, right? Like all of the places that need to hear from the opposition. There's also a Florida Freedom to Read Project, and they are doing specifically the work of supporting librarians and literacy educators. And they are following all of the bans, but more importantly, they're showing up at school board meetings and protesting and tracking and fighting back by supporting teachers and librarians on what to say and what not to say and kind of like how to get involved. Um, they're also doing the really important work of tracking where organizations like Moms for Liberty is showing up and inserting themselves and then they offer a counter like right there on the spot. And so that's really important. Um, we are actually about to launch an off social media platform uh, to protect teachers' identities, an off social media platform where we're going to be able to share resources, support one another, and I want to make that free for all educators um, who want to join. And um, so we are accepting donations in order to cover the expenses, like the manager um, and materials that we want to provide for teachers. So if people are interested in supporting us that way, they can also just contact me through our website or through any of the social media platforms. Nice. Wonderful. Well, folks, we will make sure to have links to uh, those resources uh, in the notes here below this episode, whether you are listening or watching. Um, Lorena Herman, thanks so much for joining us again today on, on All the Above. Uh, just really appreciate you and the good work you're doing in Florida. Please, uh, you know, keep your head up, stay strong, and, and keep doing what you're doing. 
All right, folks, that's it for today's seminar. Thanks so much for joining us today, uh, but stick around. Next up is our class dismissed. All right, folks, we have reached that point in the episode. Time to give some shout outs during our class dismissed. Before we get out of here, let's shine a light on some positive stories in education. Jeff, what do we have for today's class dismissed? Well, Manuel, it's only fitting that on our 100th episode uh, on this, you know, centennial of, uh, of all of the above, uh, we should have a great uplifting story coming from the wonderful state of Minnesota, uh, land of my birth, uh, home, home place of my youth, uh, <laughs> home to many members of my family still currently. Um, but uh, Manuel, this is a fascinating story because the state of Minnesota is now the fourth state in the country to offer uh, free school meals, breakfast and lunch, to all students in their public schools. Now, the fourth state in the union, which is great news. Uh, they joined California, Maine, and Colorado, who have taken similar steps uh, to do this. Um, and just this past week, uh, Governor Tim Wall signed this, uh, this bill into law. And going into next school year, into the 23-24 school year, um, every child in the state of Minnesota, at least in, you know, in public schools, will have the ability to avoid things like meal shaming, avoid things like worrying about paying off lunch debt, um, and to be able to have the stability in place where if there's any rockiness at home, you know you can count on at least two available stable meals um, at school each day. Uh, so this is a, I think, a great and wonderful thing. We've talked, uh, you know, in the past here about the importance of universal school meals um, here in the state of California. And certainly during the pandemic, there were more places around the country that temporarily put into place a universal school meals program. But as that federal funding has dried up, um, only a few states in the union have continued that uh, thus far. And Minnesota is now the fourth, which is a, a great and wonderful thing. Um, a little bit of context for folks who might be wondering, a local nonprofit there um, shared that one in four students uh, in the states who are food insecure don't technically qualify for free or reduced price lunch um, under the current federal guidelines, which really has a bar that's extremely low in terms of what we consider, you know, poverty. Um, it's it's a you know a virtually you know absolute destitution uh, level of income in many places, uh, particularly places with high costs of living. So. Um, this is really addressing uh, a huge need. And so I want to give props uh, to the folks in, in Minnesota who organized and pushed for this law and uh, so glad to see it um, pass into effect and look forward to a brighter future for students across the state of Minnesota. And hopefully many more states will follow this example because uh, this is one of those things, it's just a no brainer. It makes sense, it's good for kids. We should be providing for the needs of our uh, of our students in our communities. So props to Minnesota for making this happen. And uh, here's to many full bellies in Minnesota schools next year. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, shout out also. And, um, you know, much love to Philando Castile and his family. We ain't forgot about you, Philando. Obviously, uh, he helped many, many uh, school children in Minnesota um, have access to food before he was murdered by police. And uh, I believe his mother... Um, uh, donated money to like clear the student lunch debt or something for a lot of students in, in um, I think specifically in Minneapolis or St. Paul. I don't know, but in um, St. Paul, yeah, in yeah. Paul. So hopefully now there won't be any more lunch debt period because we shouldn't have had any in the first place. But definitely a shout out to everybody that was part of organizing around this to make sure school uh, kids have access to food because it's it's difficult to learn when you are hungry when you have an empty belly. So uh, yeah, shout out to everybody involved with this. Um, and shout out to everybody still watching or listening to this episode, our 100th episode. Uh, definitely want to extend our thanks to everybody who's um, helped make this show possible, everybody who's contributed. Of course, we are a two-person operation, and a lot of folks have been 
asking about how they could support us. And if you don't already know, you could go to aotashow.com slash support. And we have several options there um, for you. You could either contribute a small monthly amount or hit us up on Cash App or Venmo to help uh, keep this show on the road for another 100 full video episodes. So definitely um, appreciate all of y'all. Much love to the AOTA family. We will be back next week with probably a passing period. And we'll be back in two weeks with some kind of full episode. All right. Until then, take care. We love y'all.